All right. Are you good to go? Okay, recently, I started reading about something called the World Happiness Report. Ever heard of that? Anybody ever looked at it? Okay, so what it is, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's this report, because I've got more words to get out today than you can begin to imagine. Um, it's this report that measures 10 things in every country, and then it starts to rate countries as who is the happiest, right? Now, the Americans definitely think that they're gonna be the top of the list. That's just a given, right? But they're wrong. Guess who is on the top of the list? The Aussies. No, not the Aussies. Not the Aussies. Okay, I'm going to tell you. The Finns. Oh, the Finns are on the top of the list. Who is Finnish? It, oh, there's a Finn right there. <laughs> Applaud the Finn. This is Vera from Finland. She is definitely happier than most people in this room. Okay, after the Finns, they say the Danes are the next happiest. Yes, Toluca for you. Congratulations. It's the Danes, then it's Europeans, and finally, at number 12 out of 146 countries are the Aussies. Yeah, I don't think that's too bad, guys. Okay, do we want to be happy? Who wants to be happy in this room? What, so you don't want to be happy? Louise, you don't want to be happy. Okay, let me ask again. Who wants to be happy in this room? Yes, that's what I'm looking for. All right, I am at my happiest. On a Monday morning, after church is done, and it is my Sabbath day, and I'm sitting at Balmoral, either at Bather's or the Boathouse Cafe, and I'm having a little latte. Does anybody else love that space? Anyone else happy if they're there? Yes, thank you. And I'm really, really happy until I open up my phone and Beck Farr has sent me a picture of a wedding she just attended in Hawaii. Or if it was prior to October last year, if I was on Instagram, which I'm now not, I would have looked and seen what you were all doing. And my happiness can be really fleeting depending on how it compares to what you're doing. Is that right? Anybody else feel that? Like you're really content with your new runners and then you see somebody got a new pair of Jordans. And then you're like, oh, I was really happy with my VJs. Now I wish that I actually had Jordan 1s. They're so cool. My son won't let me wear them. But like comparison makes happiness really difficult. And the thing is, happiness is quite elusive. Sometimes we're happy and sometimes we're not. And I wonder if like, this world is consumed with a quest of how to be happy. We measure it all the time. There's not just a happiness report, but there's a happiness index, and that measures your personal happiness. And it says that youth pretty much sit on a 57% of happiness. That doesn't sound like a really good measure to me, right? We all want it, and we all strive after it, and for centuries, people have been looking at what it takes to make us happy. And somewhere about 150 years before Jesus, there's this guy that I want to take you back to, and his name was Sirach. And Sirach was a famous rabbi. And he put out a list of Beatitudes, and he talked to people about what it looked like for them to be hashtag blessed. And that's what I want to call my message tonight, hashtag blessed. You know, everybody writes that, doesn't, don't they, on their Instagram, like, hashtag blessed, got a new boyfriend, hashtag blessed. <laughs> Went shopping, looked cool for my formal, hashtag blessed. Got my makeup done at Mecca, hashtag blessed. Like, there are so many things that we hashtag blessed over. And Sirach, he's the ultimate in hashtag blessed. Let me show you what he says about blessed. He says, can you read this? This is his Beatitudes. He goes, I can think of nine, nine people who I would call blessed. And a tenth, my tongue proclaims. A man who can rejoice in his children is blessed. A man who lives to see the downfall of his foes, blessed. Happy, the man who lives with a sensible wife. That's quite good. I think Rich does pretty well on that one. And the one who does not plough an ox with an ass together. Go figure. You're blessed if you don't have an ox and an ass together. 
Happy is the one who does not sin with the tongue, good, and the one who does not serve an inferior. Happy is the one who finds a friend and the one who speaks to attentive listeners. How great is the one who finds wisdom, but none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. So what Sirach is saying to us tonight is you're blessed when you get everything you want. When you can keep that back up there, guys, for a second, if you will. He's saying, blessed is a man who can rejoice in his children. You know what? When I have children, I'm blessed. But when I can Instagram about how great they are, actually show everybody else, blessed. What about I'm blessed when I see the downfall of my foes. I'm blessed when I get a really good business deal. Or I'm in school and I beat everybody else for the top marks in English. I'm blessed when I actually am winning, when I'm successful, when I'm great. You're blessed when your wife makes you look good or when you've got that hot new boyfriend. So blessed. What about you're blessed uh, when you don't plough an ox and ass together? Well, when you've just got two really good cars in the garage. Yeah, you don't have a bomb and a Tesla, you've just got a Tesla and a Porsche. Like then you're blessed. You're blessed when you're not sinning, good, and when you don't serve an inferior, when you're the boss, when you're the boss at a porto, not just the worker. You're blessed when people don't tell you what to do when you actually get to call the shots, when you're the number one guy. You're blessed when you have a friend, when you're not lonely, or when you, people invite you to do things, get invited to all the cool parties, you're blessed. You're blessed when you speak to attentive listeners when Twitter actually listens to what you're saying and you've got so many followers, or when you walk in a room and people go, ooh, I wonder what she has to say. Like, you're blessed, this is good. And then he goes on, he's got a couple of other good ones at the moment. You're blessed when you find wisdom, when you're the smartest guy, but nothing is superior to the one who fears the Lord. We would all agree with that, that's good. This is what Sirach calls blessed. The only problem for me is that I've lived long enough now to know that that list of things that make you happy, a great job, really good kids, an awesome wife or a husband, like all these exterior things, they're not enough. I bet you, you know people and they've made this list, they can tick it all off and they're still not happy. You probably yourself go, I've got some of those things and it hasn't really satisfied. I don't actually just go around going, oh, how awesome am I? So then, why aren't we happy? And I wonder if it's because he's got the wrong things on his list. Now, after Sirach, 150 years later, another rabbi comes, and his name is Jesus. And in all of his teachings, he doesn't agree with that list at all. He actually turns that list upside down and creates something totally different. And why does it matter to us that Jesus, a rabbi and a teacher, thinks something very different to Sirach? Tell you why. Because Jesus isn't just any old rabbi. He's not just any old teacher. He is God incarnate. He is God with flesh and blood on. He is the one who made us and he is the one who knows how we are meant to function. He knows exactly what works for you and for I in this thing called life. And so if we turn tonight to Matthew 5, I want to direct your attention to the Beatitudes this evening. And I think that they are pretty amazing. There are eight sayings of Jesus about when we're blessed. But I want to give you a recap first. So we're five chapters in, and this is like the, um, you know, when you watch TV shows and Netflix at home, you can get the little, let me show you what's happened up until now, and you can either choose to skip it or you can watch it. We're not skipping, we're watching So here's the deal, Matthew chapter one, Jesus gets born. There's genealogy, Jesus is born. He goes to Egypt with his family. He comes out of Egypt. Um, He begins to minister. He gets baptised by John the Baptist, who is his cousin. Heaven opens, a dove descends and goes, this is my son. So the world knows that Jesus is the son of God at that point in time. Then he gets sent out into the wilderness. And while this is all happening, his cousin John starts to stir up trouble. Ooh, that's what cousins do, isn't it? You know, John is actually, um, what he does is he confronts Herod, 
the ruler of the time, and he goes, hey, what you're doing with your brother's wife, it's not right. And he calls him out on an issue of morality. Well, when you cross Herod, things don't go well for you. So John ends up in jail. And Jesus hears that John's in jail, and he starts to come back to Galilee. And in Matthew chapter four, it tells us that Jesus comes back by the way of the sea to the seaport of Galilee. And the Bible calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. And in Galilee of the Gentiles, in one of the most multicultural, diverse, heavily populated areas in the Middle East, Jesus chooses to announce that the kingdom has come to anybody who will repent and turn back to God. And then he proclaims, follow me, come follow me, and you will enter into this kingdom. And then he climbs up a mountaintop and he is about to preach the most significant sermon of all times. And this sermon's called the Sermon on the Mountain. It goes from chapters five through six through seven. And if you've got some spare time this week, you should read it because it's actually amazing, like incredible. And in chapter four, what you have to know before you start reading it is that Jesus has proclaimed the gospel and he said, everything that you have been waiting for as a Jewish people for thousands of years is about to come true. Everything that you have been waiting for, heaven is breaking into the reality of earth. Heaven is coming to earth. The future and what you've been hoping for is starting now and you're about to see things change little bit by little bit and broken people are gonna be made whole. And this is the context that we come to when we read the Beatitudes. In fact, there's a really cool verse in verse 14 and it says this, the people who have been living in darkness have seen a great light. And when Jesus announces that the kingdom's come, he also starts to do the stuff. And by the stuff, I mean he starts healing the sick and he starts restoring sight to the blind and he starts driving out demons. And what he's doing is indicative that heaven is coming to earth. What he's doing is he's showing and not just telling what's happening. And he's going right here, watch what God wants to do. God wants to restore humanity to their original intent. He doesn't want people to live broken. He wants them to live whole. And so he starts demonstrating it. That's pretty cool, right? He starts demonstrating it and it says in 4 verse 25, and people came from everywhere to see. They came from all the towns in Galilee. They came from everywhere. You know, last week, Hillsong Conference, people have done that here. God's been doing stuff in our midst and people come to see. I met a lady from Texas. I met somebody from South Africa. They hear reports of what God is doing amongst us and they come and see because that's what happens when God is on the move. And so let me read you these Beatitudes and see what you think. It says this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began teaching them and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted you, me, and the prophets before me, they will persecute you. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I've been around church a long time and I read these and either I want to ignore them or I want to Christianize them. I want to go, oh, that's so beautiful. Isn't that lovely? I'll text that to a friend. It'll really encourage her. Are you kidding me? Did you hear what Jesus said? There is no Sirach success story here. What he's doing is he's tipping everything upside down. Blessed are the poor. Who wants to be poor in here? Blessed are the ones that mourn. Blessed are the merciful and the meek. 
The little guys that get trodden on? Like, I don't know about you, I don't wanna be persecuted. This does not feel like good news to me. But Jesus is doing something in this chapter of Scripture that is remarkable and has implications for us that should change the way we live, that should make us rejoice and be glad and feel blessed. But until you understand why, you will never understand this passage. So I am gonna give you really quickly five things about the Beatitudes that you need to know in order to begin to understand this text. Is that okay? All right, so pens out, notes out, here we go. The first thing that you need to know is that these Beatitudes, they're for Jesus' climbing companions. They're not for everybody, right? They're not for everybody. They're for the ones who drew away from the healing and the show and what Jesus was doing down in the towns and were prepared to climb up the mountains with Jesus and get away from it all. They were the ones who were prepared to sit and listen prepared to take it in. And that's you and me tonight. Like you find yourself in church, congratulations. Like you are committed to pursuing Jesus. You've called yourself a climbing companion and a disciple and you have steeled away to listen to his word, to see what he has to teach you tonight. And so this is what you need to know. The first thing about the Beatitudes is this. It only makes sense in light of the gospel. What is happening here in chapter five You're blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't get the kingdom of heaven just because you're poor. You don't get the kingdom of heaven just because you mourn. You don't get to inherit the earth just because you're meek. Okay, the criteria is what we talked about in chapter four, that you've repented and you've decided to follow Jesus, right? So the criteria for this is still grace by faith in Jesus Christ, that you have actually been saved by grace through faith, right? You get, you can't do this by yourself. You came to Jesus empty handed and he accepted you into his kingdom and he brought you near and he went, well done, you get in, you get in. Now what he's doing here is something totally different. He's making you understand here that nothing disqualifies you from the kingdom that we would have thought in the time were bad things. Stick with me. Second thing you need to know is that these aren't commands and they're not virtues. So Jesus in the Beatitudes, he's not saying to you, hey, get more poor and you can get the kingdom. Hey, mourn a little bit more and you can get the kingdom. Hey, be a peacemaker and you'll be called a child of God. Like he's not saying that. This is not, if you're in these situations, you can get this. I used to think when I was little and I read the Beatitudes at Sunday school, this was like a lucky prize list and that I could choose which prize I wanted and therefore what I needed to become to get the prize. I went, I wanna see God. I need to be pure in heart. Yeah, yeah, I'll work hard at that. That is not what is going on here. These are not commands and they're not virtues. If you have been a Christian in any way, shape or form for very long, you know you cannot earn your way into this kingdom of God. There is nothing that you can do to qualify yourself from this and there is nothing that you can do that disqualifies you when Jesus is your Saviour and you are holding on to Him, right? There are processes for sanctifications and ways to become Christ-like. But you cannot qualify yourself. Jesus qualifies us, right? So... What we know is this, Eugene Peterson says, the way we should live our lives around the beatitude is that we should continue to put ourselves in the neighbourhood so that we can experience God's work in Jesus Christ. These beatitudes, if they're not commands, what are they? There's something that tells us what the kingdom of God looks like. It's painting a picture for you and me that goes, it's not just the rich that get in, it's not just the successful. Jesus goes, when you're poor, the kingdom comes there. When you mourn, the kingdom comes there. The kingdom comes when we find ourselves in these situations that were not esteemed in early times and aren't esteemed now. This is counter-cultural stuff. I went to Denmark on exchange when I was 15. And at the top of Denmark, you can stand at Skein with your foot in one sea called cataract, uh, in another foot in a sea called 
Gadarat? Nilly? I'm almost close, right? Standing two C's. This is what's happening here. Up until Jesus, people had been standing in one sea. The Pharisees knew what religion looked like, knew what the way to God looked like, and they were enforcing a heavy yoke on people. Then Jesus comes and there's another sea, and they meet. And we have a choice as the people of God as to whether we're gonna live in the world's way of doing things or whether we're actually gonna come over to Jesus' side. And Jesus' side, it's upside down. It doesn't look like anything that you and I know. Third thing that you need to know is that right here in the Beatitudes, there's a current and a future reality at play. You know, the Kingdom of God, Jesus says, it's come near, it's breaking in. It's here and it's not here in its entirety. And we live in a place where theologians call the now and the not yet. And so when you read the Beatitudes, you've got to hear that some things will happen right now and some things won't happen just yet. And we're not sure what happens when, and it is a bit of a mystery, but what we do know is that of the eight blessings, the first one and the last one are in present tense. So it says, if you are poor in spirit, you will. The kingdom of heaven is yours. It is yours. Right now, kingdom of heaven is yours. If you are persecuted, kingdom of heaven is yours. The other six are actually in future tense. So it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When will they be comforted? Do you know what? Maybe a little bit now and a lot then. So for those of you who have lost people that you love, you know that this is true. You know that like, there's a little bit of comfort that comes from God now and a little bit of comfort that comes from being in community, but nothing like the comfort that will come in heaven one day when all the dead rise in Christ and you see the people that you have loved with everything. So there is hope now but there is expectation and something better coming and it's the same with all of them. The meek, they'll inherit the earth. The blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. The merciful will be shown mercy. Pure of heart will see God. And so there's these things that are now but not yet and there's a tension between our current reality and what is to come in the future and that's what it means to live Christian, to live in this tension of this world and what is to come. So it doesn't always work, but it's like C.S. Lewis's picture in Narnia, where the children find themselves outside of the wardrobe in winter, but summer is coming. And as they journey, the ice is melting. And that's what it's meant to look like for you and I, as we are kingdom people. We're bringing the kingdom to earth in all of our interactions, in all of our relationships with each other, in all of the way that we deal with each other. We're melting the winter and spring is coming and it is a sign that Jesus' rule and reign is taking hold on earth. We're kingdom people. That is what you and I are meant to be and the Beatitudes actually show us who these kingdom people actually are. And then it's a self-portrait. And I'm not gonna go into it too much, but Jesus actually fulfills every single one of these Beatitudes all through Scripture. He's not asking us to be anything that He isn't already Himself. And time and again, He is poor, He is mourning, He is meek, He is humble, He is gentle, He is pure of heart, He is a peacemaker, and He is persecuted. And because He was, He recognises when we are those things and the Kingdom comes there. And then finally, blessed, it's just not what you think. This word for blessed, like we live in a church where we're told all the time, blessed to be a blessing. And that is true. And that is one word for blessed. But this word here that Jesus uses, it's a different word. And the word is makarios. And makarios is not a common word that, that you and I use. It's very difficult to translate it into English. But what it was, was it was um, more than happy and it was more than blessed. It was an alignment, a right alignment. There's ways that people talk about it, but the best use, it was a salutation, a greeting in the Greek world. And so like if somebody had a baby, you would go, Makarios! Congratulations on that new baby. Makarios on your wedding. Makarios on your new job. And that's offensive because here Jesus is going, Makarios, congratulations when you're poor. Yay, you. 
Wow, we don't say that to each other, do we? Congratulations, you're mourning. This is great news. You know, Carl Barth said, um, you can even say, you're lucky bum. You're lucky bum when you're a peacemaker. You're lucky bum. I feel like if I was Brent Garrett, I might say, on your mate. <laughs> on your mate. And that's what's happening here, right? Jesus is actually esteeming when people find themselves in the poorest of circumstances, rough times, when they find themselves trying to campaign for peace. He's doing something incredible and tipping the kingdom on its head. I don't know if you hear how revolutionary and amazing this is, but for you and for me, this is incredible news. This is amazing and I'll tell you why. Because the last three years have been rough. <laughs> because for any one of us, the last three years have stolen our joy and our sense of security and our sense of hope. And you know what Jesus says? Makarios. Congratulations, church, that the last three years have been rough for you because maybe, just maybe that will drive you deep into me and into a place where you look for me and you find me. Yeah, it's not actually that great, guys, because I've lived it and I've felt it and I've gone, God, I feel so poor in spirit. I don't know about you, I read the Bible and I go, this is hard. I can't forgive like that. I don't want to love like that. I don't want to wait patiently for the Lord to renew my strength. I want it now. And I come to God like this, poor in spirit, going, God, I got nothing to give you. I'm inadequate and I'm not good enough. And he goes, Makarios, come here. Hey, Cassie, getting it right. I don't know about you, but there have been times in the last three years I have mourned. I have been broken by the state of our church and where we find ourselves. I have been so sad about the loss of friends. I have cried tears over people who have passed away. I have felt broken by the season. Jesus, Makarios Gas, congratulations, because I'm waiting here to provide comfort. And you know that church community, they'll gather around you when it's not like that. It's beautiful. Over the last couple of years, I've watched people who have extended mercy and I've seen them trodden on and I felt sad and broken by it. I have longed for relationships. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for those is the kingdom of heaven. I have wanted that more than anything, right relationships. And watch our earth groan because the right relationships mean right relationships with the earth, with God, with each other and with yourself. And I have felt the breaking of those relationships and I have grieved over them. But it says when we long for right relationships, even when we don't have them, Jesus will fill us and satisfy us. And it goes on and on. And so tonight, I thought I would just say to you, Hillsong Church, if you find yourself here and you are poor in spirit, if you're one of the ones who can't get it right, or if you live with little or nothing to offer, if you are on the wrong side of the world or feel like you're not smart enough, if you come to church and feel so simple spiritually and empty-handed, or you read the Bible like I do and you go, I just, I don't live like that then tonight I feel like the Lord would say he sees you and be encouraged because when there is less of you, there is more of God. Maybe here tonight you're mourning. Maybe you've suffered loss over the last couple of years and you are sad or you are depressed. Maybe you've buried loved ones or you have miscarried. Or maybe you can't fall pregnant and you've cried many tears over that. Maybe you have mourned over the racial injustice on the earth or you've been broken by mental health issues or rejection or isolation. I think tonight Jesus would say, consider yourself lucky because one day God will wipe every tear from your eye himself. Don't you think that's beautiful? 
to those who are gentle and meek, the ones who aren't the most powerful in this room, to the ones who are not on the right side of the way the dice rolls, to the one who's uh, oppressed, or you feel overlooked for every opportunity, you feel under-celebrated or underseen. I tell you tonight, rejoice, because one day, the Bible promises you will find yourself proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. And to those here who are hungry for right relationships, who are desperate for things to be restored or reconciled. But people who have kids who are away and are not talking to you or fathers that they are estranged from, from people who have messed up or who don't get it right, be happy because one day God promises that you will eat your fill and be satisfied with the sweetest of relationships. And to those who are merciful, the ones who continue to get walked over or passed by or looked over by others, who show kindness even in the face of meanness and hostility, one day the care that you show to others will be returned to you by care that God has for you. And to those who are pure-hearted, to our youth guys who long to see Jesus, to the mums and dads who lock yourself away and seek God in his word and pray, to the ones who are pure-hearted in everything that they do, the promise for you is that you will see God. And to the peacemakers, the one who exchange violence for nonviolence, who seek to bring a new world to pass, who seek to understand and reconcile when it's painful or take the higher road, you are fortunate because everyone will see one day that you bear the marks of your Father in heaven. And to the persecuted, you know my friend Mike Gore, he works for Open Doors and he tells stories of the church in countries outside of Australia where the persecution is so rife and so horrible and so awful. that People are martyred for their faith and tortured and tormented. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But for us too, and if the band wanna come, For you and for me, we live in a post-Christian culture that is aggravated and offended by the things of God. You are accused of being irrelevant and made fun of. You are teased for being stupid or mean in your thoughts about the world. And I wanna tell you, rejoice. You are lucky because you are getting your share in the cross-shaped life. You are looking more and more like Jesus and following in his ways and the kingdom of God is coming. And I don't know about you, but I feel like when I read that list in my Bible to start with, I cannot see myself in it. And then when I think of it like that, I go, God, I am a beatitude person. Your kingdom has come close to me because I can relate to those things. We might live in the affluent West but we can all identify with that. And so what? So what does that mean? Jesus goes up on the mount and he continues the sermon after telling us what the picture of the kingdom looks like, who qualifies and who gets in. And he says this. So let me tell you why you're here, church. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours in this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and you will end up in the garbage. And here's another way to put it. You are here to be light. When Jesus came in that verse in Matthew chapter four, it says a great light shone in the darkness. And when we started to understand that we got in on this kingdom, you know what we became? Lights in the darkness. The Bible calls us, You are light bearers. What you've discovered about God is not a secret to be kept. You are to go public with this, as public as a city on the hill. And if I am making you light bearers, don't think I am gonna hide you under a bucket, do you? I am putting you on a light stand. And now that you are there on the hilltop, on a light stand, shine. That is what His encouragement to you and to me as part of this new kingdom is to get out there in the world to shine our light as brightly as we can. And he says, keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you will prompt people to open up to God, this generous Father in heaven. Hillsong Church, don't let the world believe that the Kingdom of God is all about success and power and money and fame. The Kingdom of God 
is about us, all of us getting in. The Kingdom of God is about a whole new reality. The Kingdom of God is about Jesus being known on earth as it is in heaven. The Kingdom of God is better than you and I can imagine and we get in. And so this week, this is my encouragement to you. What a big ministry time, not come forward on altars, but go and be light bearers. Go and be the salt of the earth. Make it salty, light up the world with hope. Actually take your everyday life and live as the Beatitude people of Hillsong Church. Witness publicly, shine brightly, live generously. Invite people into the kingdom life that you are invited into and let Jesus be seen in everything. May the light come and dispel the darkness in Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So why don't you stand to your feet. And Father, I pray for Your people this week. I pray, Father God, as we have a revelation of this Kingdom that is so beautiful that we are a part of, where You tip everything on its head and You invite us in, that God, we would be salt and light, that we would be light bearers, that everything that we would do would point to You. God, I pray for opportunities and strategic conversations in this room tonight. Lord, as kids go back to school, I pray that their schools would experience revival life. God, where there has been disappointment, disenfranchised, where there is mourning, where there is poverty, may You come close. And Father, set us a light with hope. May our mouths burn to tell Your goodness and Your grace in Jesus' Name. And Father, may we be light and everything we do light up the world. Who's embracing the poor, comfort for all those who mourn with the broken hearted. Sing louder, release from prison and shame. Good news, embracing the poor, comfort for 
purify our hearts in your fire. Breathe in us, we pray. Come on, last time we sing. Let there be light. Open our eyes. Before we do anything, we should uh, really thank and honor Cass for that message. She, um, she, Cass, you're just gifted at articulating the beautiful heart of the gospel. And every time you get up there, it, in a different way, in a different manner, you just, you just catch a piece of the heart of Jesus, don't you? And uh, I don't know about you, I'm impacted and challenged and blessed by that message. So Cass, thank you so much. This is why you're my favourite, Cass. Um, I guess that begs only one question. After a message as beautiful as that, is do you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I mean, we've heard it's not just about being meek or not just being about, being about poor, but all of these without Jesus is just traits. But you put Jesus in the mix and it changes everything. So my question to you at church on a Sunday night is do you know Him? Not have you heard about Him, not have you been to church, not did you know Him, but do you know Him? Are you in a tangible relationship with Jesus? I love this language that we often hear in church. It says, Jesus is your Lord, your Saviour and your best friend. And you hear it, you think, best friend, that's really cool. Like He's gonna be there in the ups and the downs and everything in between, in my highs and my lows, Jesus is there. And you think, yeah, that's awesome. But then you get to Saviour and you have to come to this point of admission, which Cass articulated so well. We can't do life by ourselves. We literally were not created to. And because we have sinned, sinned and fallen short, the truth is we need a Saviour. Let this altar call be black and white. It is not anything to do with us, but it is everything to do with Jesus. And because of Him coming and dying and on a cross, it gives us a chance that God does not see our sin and our failure, but He sees us through the, through the lens of Christ Jesus. You, you hear friend, you hear Saviour, but then you hear Lord, and Lord can often, especially these days, it kind of rubs people up the wrong way, doesn't it? Because Lord is just saying, it's, it's not my way. It's not my thinking. It's not my opinion that counts, but when you're under someone's Lordship, well, here's another word that's not popular. You're also obedient to them. And so everyone loves the best, the best friend part of a relationship with Jesus. And everyone's all about, yeah, yeah, well, he's my best friend. And yeah, you know what? You're right, Drew. I do need saving. I have messed up. My life's not perfect. And, and I understand Jesus can give me that, but the Lord part, there, we, there is power in the, in the Lord part. Here's why. Because when you give your life to Jesus, if you align your life and your decisions with the Word of God, it revolutionises everything. So tonight, I wanna pray for a group of people in here while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And you're saying, Drew, tonight's the night. Maybe you've made this decision before but you're saying, you feel like your, your decisions have dislocated you from a relationship with Jesus. Jesus have never left you. But you're saying, tonight's the night, Drew, I'm coming back. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm not going halfway in, but I'm giving Him my everything, my best friend, my Saviour and my Lord. Or you're in this place, whether you've come to church for the first time or you do this week in and week out, and for the first time you're saying, Tonight's the night, I'm giving, I'm giving it all. I'm giving my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm just gonna ask you bravely on the count of three, would you shoot your hand up? Can I tell you this is the best decision you'll ever make? I remember making this over 17 years ago. Nothing changed an instant. But over time, as I found myself in the Word of God, it changed everything. One, Jesus loves you. He, he loves you so much too. I said this is the best decision because here's, here's the thing. This is more important than what university, what job, where you live. It's even more important than who you marry because this decision is not just for the temporal. This decision is for the eternal. So on the count of three, maybe, maybe you're having this battle between your head and your heart. You're thinking, I'm not sure what to do in this moment. 
Can I just encourage you right now from someone who has made this very decision that it is the best choice that you'll ever make and you'll never look back. So if that's you on the count of three, would you shoot your hand up with me? One, two, three, all over this place. Thank you, God bless you. 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 I'm just gonna wait just a few more seconds. And the reason I wait is because the truth is I was that, I was that student I was that young person back in the day, I said in my head, I'm like, if they just ask one more time, I'll put my hand up. And I feel in my spirit that there's more people in here and and, and you're just having this internal dialogue right now. So can I ask you one more time, friends? On the count of three, either, either you've already put your hand up or you know you haven't, but you really want to. Would you shoot it up for me one more time just so I can pray with you? One, two, three, shoot them up. Awesome, God bless you. God bless you, worth waiting for. God bless you. God bless. Church, can we thank everyone who's making this decision? I mean, the Bible says when one person gives their life to Jesus that there is a party in heaven. And there ain't no party like a new Christian party, Nancy. I, um, I, I wanna pray a prayer as a church family. So in this moment, would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus, say, Jesus, tonight's the night. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you everything. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And thank You that You've got my future in Your hand. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. One more time. Can we thank everyone? Oh, hello. For those of you who put your hand up, I, uh, I'll encourage you, even if you're the meekest person in the room or you're the quietest person in the room, on your way out, we'll have people waving these around, sometimes really frantically, it's, it's interesting. Um, but as you, as you walk out, make sure you grab one. This is not just any book, this is the Bible, B-I-B-L-E. And everything that Cass preached about, everything that we talk about on this platform, it comes directly out of this book. And the more you read it, the more it reads you. And it's not just, it's not letters on a page. It's a 66 book love letter. And you gotta get into it and you gotta soak it up because this is, this is Jesus in a book, right? And so I would encourage every new person, every Christian, actually, I would encourage everyone in this room, find yourself in the Bible. It'll change your life. So uh, it, will, it really will. So if you, if you put your hand up or maybe you don't have one and you're like, I've lost my Bible, just grab one on the way out. Sam Demaro's got it covered, okay? Don't you worry about that. But church, that has been us for tonight.